Hello and welcome to Starting Conversations. I'm Bethany Tabor, and this program is brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. This session is part of our newest Starting Conversations series on community archiving. During this series, we will be exploring the practice of archiving and expanding our understanding of what archiving is and what it means even. Many of us are familiar with the academic approach to archiving, which is cataloging and organizing information to be housed in a place like a library. But community archiving is an approach that sounds new, but actually goes uh, much deeper back in human history. Traditions and culture ways are preserved through communal efforts to pass down information from generation to generation. And this series is highlighting the Manito Community Memory Project, which is a digital community-based archive that is facilitated and organized by the New Mexico Highlands University Department of Media Arts and Technology. This session is facilitated by Shane Flores with guests Katie Gross and Isabel Trujillo. Conceptual artist and interdisciplinary culture worker, Mr. Flores is a community facilitator for the Manitos Community Memory Project and is the principal at Studio Wet Future, developing history and culture-based content for cultural institutions, including the Bradbury Science Museum, the City of Las Vegas Museum, New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs, and UNM Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. He holds a BFA in media arts from New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Katie Gross is deputy director and education director at Little Globe. She is a photographer, educator, multimedia producer, and mother. Born and raised in Santa Fe, New Mexico, she fell in love with photography as a teenager when she took a black and white darkroom class at the local teen arts center, Warehouse 21. She holds an MA in arts education from NYU and a BA from Brown University in international development studies. She studied documentary photography at the Salt Institute for Documentary Studies in Portland, Maine, and at the former College of Santa Fe. She has traveled to Ghana volunteering for a non-governmental organization that promotes women entrepreneurs and traveled to the South Pacific to accompany a film crew following six Navajo code talkers revisiting World War II battlefields. She has been leading multimedia storytelling and production workshops with youth and community members since 2011. She developed the Culture Connects Toolkit, which is a set of practices and tools for implementing storytelling and engagement workshops in various community settings and feels passionately about utilizing art and story work to respond to community needs in a variety of ways. Isabel Ward Trujillo has been the grant writer and director for El Pueblo de Abiquiu Library and Cultural Center for around 20 years. Her intergenerational projects have resulted in special collections that serve to give audio and visual presentations for others around the world to understand about the Henizado people of Abiquiu. She has brought many people together for discussions and, and included youth to participate in order for them to gain pride and awareness for new creative career paths that allow them to remain in the area and continue these stories of historical facts that can help to guide their future with experience and awareness. And with that, Shane, I will hand it over to you. Uh, great, thank you. Thanks, Bethany. Um, I'm going to start, I'm really excited about this conversation, but I'm going to start with a very brief contextual preamble um, regarding the Minitos Community Memory Project, just because we're going to talk about it later and I want people to know what we're talking about. Uh, so the main focus of the Minitos Community Memory Project is the creation of a digital community archive for Minitos cultural and history. Uh, the archive is intended to serve the dual purpose of preserving a digital record of cultural continuity, meaning, of course, photos, documents, audiovisual recordings, and digital records of objects, but also providing access to that cultural record. Um, as our project director, Esteban Royal Galvez, puts it, a place for the Menidos people to see themselves. Um, for those who uh, need to know what Menitos are, um, my simple answer uh, that I've come up with, which there's whole areas of study of what this means, is it's simply a self-applied identity within the land-based culture that emerged in the mountains of Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado uh, during the Spanish colonial land grant period and is shaped by the dynamics of the land grants, both or including the private community and Pueblo land grants. Uh, as far as what a community archive is, uh, it's a lot of different things. But for us, it's really about taking what uh, is usually an institutional uh, guided approach to saving things and uh, more taking, uh, giving the power back to the community to define what it means for them to archive things and what's important and, and meaningful. Um, so, uh, 
Isabel and Katie, I'm kind of really excited about this conversation because I, I see both Isabel and Katie working on the front lines of uh, what I consider community-based documentation and preservation of storytelling. Uh, the storytelling includes not only uh, you know, what most people might call oral histories about life and things, but, you know, the, the, the record of a community, the storytelling record of a community, and knowledge ways and skills ways, and they both focus a lot on youth engagement with media, which I think is a very, very uh, exciting space to work in, um, and these include both production skills and media literacy, you know, that are really required to create the next generation of storytellers, so uh, with that little uh, preamble, I guess. Uh, I kind of wanted to jump into a, a couple of questions. Isabel, yourself specifically, um, you know, I'd kind of like to ask you, uh, how do the stories of the past help guide future decisions for the benefit of uh, land and people and surroundings? Like, and I know this speaks very directly to your, you know, specific work um, at the Abbey Q Cultural Center. So uh, yeah, so that's my question to you. Okay, um, so a lot of times we find that um, things have already been addressed in the past. Uh, what worked, what didn't work. Um, having that awareness, it makes things easier to decide on how to do more things in the future, right? It's, say your question again one more time. I'm gonna... Okay. Um... How do the stories of the past help to guide future decisions uh, for the benefit of land and you know the people and, and the surroundings in the, in the community that you work in? So, so I guess what comes to mind is that the stories of the past have uh, the reasoning for why they worked or didn't work, right? And so stories of the past and uh, being aware of how something was addressed and why it or why not it didn't work it or didn't work. Um, the factors that went into it, uh, you know, the, the change in time, uh, the different how factors, how those factors change in time, right? Uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, we find that yes, things have been addressed before, for some reason or other, they, they couldn't be dealt with at the time. And so maybe this day and age, they can be, but different technologies, kind of that. But, uh, that's what comes to mind. And so, Katie, I have a question for you yourself, just, you know, to kind of us to get the ball rolling. And it, it's kind of about um, the process of, of sharing memories and experiences. How do, you, how do you see those change, you know, the story st storytellers specifically, but also the collective consciousness of, the, of the, that story, you know, the, the, that surrounds that storyteller? Yeah, I think that... Um you know, just the very act of sharing stories, um, both individually and in, in a community, um, is opening yourself up to being changed. So often we don't even know like the meaning of our story until we share it and it, um, it becomes released from ourselves. And, and stories are very subjective and memories can often not always be necessarily truthful. I mean, they're truthful to the person, but factual, I guess, you know, they're very personal and subjective. So I think that when you, when you share that in a community setting, um, you know, you're opening yourself up to be vulnerable. And then as people are listening to other people's stories, they're being changed by the stories as well. And maybe it's helping them think of, of experiences that they've had and things that they share and, and helping to them to draw on experiences. Um, so, you know, I think it's valuable to share memories and stories individually, you know, writing them down or, or um, you know, doing it uh, kind of, alone, I guess you could say, but when you're doing it in a group setting or with other people, then it becomes this, this actual relationship and this more of this communal sharing of experiences and information and realizing that uh, your story and experience is in relation to other people and, and being affected by that. Okay, so so following on that, I think, and so let's stay, stick with you, Katie, and then I'll, I'll ask you, Isabel, kind of the same thing after, but then feel free to also like, oh, 
Shane, shut up, because I want to respond to, you know, what each other just said. So please do that. Um, you know, what, so, so Katie, you first, what, what do you consider the primary challenge uh, of working on the front lines, right, and, and that? So you just described the very positive aspect experience. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to kind of drill down on what you see as really challenging about community memory gathering and collective storytelling. Yeah, so in that, in that same vein, the act of being vulnerable and asking people to be vulnerable in sharing memories and experiences. Um, you know, you need to just be aware of what what is being drawn out of people. Um, so a lot of that is is I mean, it mostly comes down to building trust. And that's the the main aspect of this work is building that foundation of trust among community members and, you know, facilitators and story gatherers. Um, and that's that's foundational to our work. You know, we often talk about relationship before task. It's about forming those relationships and those bonds between people. So, you know, I think I found that it's really important even before going into the story sharing to, you know, share a meal or share some kind of experience, some communal experience that helps lay that foundation. And, and um, you know, it's not diving into the vulnerable stories immediately when you first meet someone or bringing people together for the first time and asking them to share something that's deeply personal. Um, it, it's something that needs to be built up and, um, and give people the opportunity to, to know what they're getting into, um, to have the opportunity to to participate and maybe not participate if they if they don't feel comfortable if they don't feel like they're ready to do so. Um, so it's important in our work with at Little Globe also to have different points of access for the for the story sharing as well. Um, and what that means for us is maybe having different art modalities that people can utilize. So um, some people may want to write their stories down. Some people may want to say them out loud in a group. Some people may want to go somewhere and record their story and then share it and everyone listens to it later. Um, some people want to be interviewed, you know, having all these different ways that people can, um, can find their own voice and their own way of feeling comfortable to to share is really important and um yeah that kind of gets into the the non-extractive aspect of the work too which there's just a, a long history of that kind of work and people going in and saying i'm going to get those stories or we we talk about capturing people's stories or things like that you know so trying to move away from from that language and that way of thinking and having it be much more um coming from the, the community itself so that they feel a sense of ownership, they feel a sense of um, agency in the, in the sharing of their story and how the story is gonna be used. Okay. Um, Isabel, before I ask you the same question, I, I, I wouldn't mind if I could, if I could ask you, I know I'm breaking my own weird rules here, uh, is to talk a little bit about the extractive nature of things, you know, that Katie just mentioned. And then and then I'll return to that other question. But I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on the the you know sensitivity to extraction. Yeah. Yes, because uh in going into the homes with youth, you know, you set up an appointment, you you make that prior call, you get the person comfortable uh, the visit, set the right place. But then um, they need to be able to take something back with them a lot of times. So if you go from a black and white photo to a digitized uh, floppy with all your photos, something like that. But um, in my experience going into the homes and uh, taking a portable scanner, or, or if it's not even the home, it's wherever the site is that you're meeting. But we started to take a portable scanner because the, the people found were not allowing us to take the photos with us back to the center, make our copies, and then take promise to take them back. So that mistrust, right? Uh, taking the scanner with us to the site where they immediately get their photos back. Um, <laughs> and then, like I say, if there's something to take away with them, also that's a benefit, like that floppy drive with the digital photos that they can in turn turn around and share. Um, you know, making it so that it's visible, tangible, um, 
comfortable all the way around. Uh, what I find right, though, so in, hand, yeah. what I find though in Sorry. the in the prior question is that um, the nomenclature, right? Uh, the language, because some yeah. people uh, want uh, not their photos to be on internet or you know, they only want them to be used for a certain reason. They don't want anybody else accessing. You know, you, you gotta put that language down in writing. They need to be comfortable that, that you're gonna honor that. And so, um, administrative passwords, whatever it takes, really. But um, yeah, having the language in writing so that uh, people sign off on it and and uh, they don't feel that it's going to go out commercially, commercially, you know, their families, pictures, photos, whatever, are not be turned over to somebody else commercially and, and uh, you know, exploited or money be made off of that. You know, and they never see royalties, or you know, there's there's this belief that, that there are royalties, and so people want what they share uh, when it's used. They want it to be accessible um, only in how they would like it to see it out in the public. So if, if your written language says, um, you know, in order to use this for any other reason, you must contact the family prior so that they're fully aware and you know capable of responding to them. So, so do you see this sort of transparency and accountability as the primary challenge of, of community memory gathering and collective storytelling or is there another aspect that you want to speak to as well um, kind of returning to the original question is that the main one or do you have a different one that you see? Well no overall it's a matter of information being clear and uh, everybody being comfortable and if it has to be uh, signed off on, uh, then that's what it takes. Um, also, you know, like I said, setting it up and having it visibly set up so that nobody can access it without their approval. That's what they want. And if they allow it to be shared, uh, you know, spell it out how and why, and uh, then always referring back to them if need be or something like that. People are afraid of that, of that, um, you know, that foresight getting out of hand. So, so, um, so kind of the next thing I, I wanted to ask about was, um, and, and let's go ahead and return to you, Katie, just to, to stay in a rhythm or something is, um, how do you, so how do you view the role of technology and how you work and, and how does it affect your, your view of collective memory? And sort of how does it affect how uh, your community collaborators view collective memory? So kind of a two-part question there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, I mean, overall, I feel like technology is really useful and really um, getting more and more accessible and, and exciting in, um, you know, in the things that you can do. So you know, one, one of the main things that I find technology to be useful is just with our, our iPhones or our smartphones um, and trying as best we can to utilize those in the recording and creating of stories and, and media. So um, yeah, in the past it was maybe like, yeah, a documentary film crew would go in somewhere and film. And, and that's some of the work that we still do, but um, we've been, developing something that we call co-authoring stories. So actually trying to teach people how to use their phones um, as much as they can to actually record themselves, to document themselves um, just using their own cameras in their phone. And um, <clears throat> last year with the, with the pandemic, um, we were trying to figure out ways that we could continue gathering stories virtually. And um, we, found this software that's called JotForm and it's an online um, form that you can create different questions and people can actually, you know, they can write their answers, but then they can also upload photos, they can record audio and put it in there, even record videos and you can set it up to actually be um, linked to a, a Google spreadsheet. So all that information can go right into a spreadsheet and it's um, in theory, very, very easy and accessible, but we also found that in reality, it, it had its challenges. Um, mainly 
what I found was, you know, you can have these forms of technology that make it easy for people to, to do that, but you still need that human aspect, that human relationship um, in place as well. So, you know, just sending someone a form and, and saying, here, fill this out and upload photos and, and do these things um, isn't going to work for everyone. And so being able to still have those um, those human relationships, those experiences where you can help guide people if there's if there can still be some way um, of having story sharing in person or or the, the gathering process still be human centered and you know not technology technologically focused, um, I think is really important. But um, you know, I think it'll be exciting to see how technology continues to develop and um, just trying to think about if there are different ways that we can start recording other senses besides audio and, and vision, you know, like I wonder about if we'll one day be able to capture smell or taste or something like that. And, um, you know, that's such a huge part of memory and, and stories and experience. So yeah, it could happen. You never know. So <laughs> Taste would be really good considering the importance of food. Uh, so in, in regards to kind of the second question, and maybe I'm yeah. going to nuance this a little based on what you said, you know, uh, I, I hear, so that part about whether it changes the community collaborators view of collective memory, you know, what I'm hearing you describe is like now they're participatory in the gathering process versus being the subject of a uh, expert coming to gather your story. So how mm -hmm. have you seen, do you have any um, observations that you've had like in the field that sort of speak to, to that difference now that they're actively involved in the collaborate or in, in the you know, active collaborators in the gathering process? Yeah, well, um, even as we speak, I was just, um, our, we had a few, few people from our, our team in Gallup last week and we were filming. And for the most part, we were documentary filmmakers and we were going in and we were interviewing people and, and filming. And there was one young woman who we interviewed and, um, and you know, then I talked to her about, oh, it would be, it would be really great if we could you know, see the house that you're talking about and see the, your family and, and all these things. And so we were talking about that. And she said, I'll check with my family. And she came back to us and said, yeah, they're not really comfortable. They don't, they don't really wanna do it. You know? And then I said, well, what about if you were to film yourself and you were the one doing it? And we're in that process right now where she's gathering the footage herself and she's the one who's helping to document her own family. And so in that way, it's much less, yeah, like outsider in of us coming in and, and you know, we're, we're not from there, so we don't necessarily, and you can understand her family might not be comfortable and sharing that, but if it is um, someone, you know, a family member who's doing that, then, then that helps in that process. Okay, cool, thanks. I feel like that's a perfect segue to actually ask you, Isabel, that question, knowing what I know about what I feel you've been doing innovating technology, but I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna let you talk about, so the same question, how, 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 do you, how do you view the role of technology and how you work and, and how you view collective memory? And, and again, the same follow-up question, which is how, how uh, do your community collaborators now view collective memory in light of that? So kind of the same, same thing, yeah. Technology helps keep long lasting archives in visual format and everyone can enjoy that. Plus bring uh, up to date uh, transferring equipment. You know? So if something becomes outdated, keeps it ongoing. Um, community um, collaborators see a collective gathering of memories as a um, combined effort, uh, you know, input from within the area and people involved. And so maybe something like uh, everybody almost in agreement, right? It's so easily to partner with, this is my point of view on that, on the collaborators. Um, they see us when uh, we're organized, um, you know, and experienced. And so 
I've found that we've been able to access more partnerships because of the collections that we have. And uh, so the other question, how, uh, how do I view collective memory? Is that, is that it? Yeah, the role of technology in collective memory, yeah. Yeah, so, so collective memory to me is very important, very important because it forms community um, you know, in the past and in the future experience from um, new ideas from everyone's input uh, it, it invites um, input from everyone by right. having these events that are announced for um, collective memory to me you know this question a lot for me and being familiar with your work is about um uh um like you know the 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 role of technology that you see with the youth in particular and the youth programs that you work with to make sure that they are basically gathering the 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 you know collective memory in your community so i just maybe want to ask you to talk a little about what you've been doing with the youth programs there yeah well at this point we've been trying just to form a team um, to reform yeah. Because what happens is the youth move on, and uh, then you've got to retrain. <laughs> and so, what I've decided nowadays is to um, recruit a lead person, and a lead person with experience in gathering history and old history interviews. So, in other words, um, at the library and cultural center, I'm, I've always got an eye open and, and ear out for. Then I just try to approach our interest, and I'm always recruiting. And then at the same time, the youth, but also elders and their stories. But um, yeah, forming a team. Okay, cool. Thank, thank you. Um, so uh, now kind of pivoting a little bit in our questions to the role of the archive, right? So um, maybe thinking a little bit about Manitos Archive and, you know, uh, sort of how you both are participating in that and, and your thoughts about archive generally, but specifically Menidos archive. Uh, so preserving that this work that you do in community, right? And preserving the work, the type of work we've been talking about. Um, how do you view the relationship between that work, gathering, gathering the, you know, so the story gathering and, 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 you know, the content gathering, I guess, and, and the archive, is it changing how you view uh, this whole process? Or I guess I forget it, I'm not gonna self edit, just generally, how do you view the relationship between your work and, and the archive? Yeah, uh, go ahead and you go, let's for, just for kicks, you go first, Isabel, just for kicks this time, we'll switch it up, yeah. Well, for me, the archive remains, it, it stays with the center, whether I come or go or whoever comes and goes, the archive continues. It's it's here and it's solid. <laughs> I mean, you know, it can grow, but it'll always remain. And so, um, um, one other thing I have learned is that it should be organized. Uh, it got out of hand for us. It grew too fast, and and then it, and then we were trying to organize after the fact. And so, by organize, depends, I guess, on the factors that we like to highlight. Um, whether it's the year that you're addressing or a last name, you know, mm -hmm. that you're addressing uh, an, an area, location, but um, that type of organization so that it's easily accessible and very um, easy to uh, access and understand and, and move through, through about. Yeah, can, can I ask you to elaborate on accessibility? I mean, it's a thing that I think often in archives well, some archi archi archivists success over accessibility, but since you mentioned it, like talk to me a little bit about why accessibility is important for you and in your community and stuff. Well, because um, we, here in Abiquiu, we have one librarian at a time, right? Mm -hmm. um, not a whole lot of support staff, um, a very small library, very rural library. And so um, that person has to be and informed and, and familiar with the community, the people around them. And uh, 
have also maybe some sort of contact uh, person to call upon because uh, maybe somebody elder, maybe somebody that's been in the community longer than, than them. Um, but yeah, uh, people come and go, the patrons also change. And so about accessibility, um, we have an M drive, which is a large storage, a terabyte. And so we have a scanner that everything goes from the scanner into the M drive. And then it takes someone at that point to, to place that information into the proper file so that when somebody comes and sits behind the, uh, the station, the desk, mm -hmm. um, they know where to go and know what to look for because it depends on what they're researching. Um, mm -hmm. We have the old cemetery, all GPS, and uh, every plot is in the computer lab mm -hmm. on this uh, terabyte mm -hmm. so that visitors to the area don't go um, over to the actual site because the community doesn't like to see tourists in the cemetery. <laughs> and so <laughs> they guide them to the uh, library and cultural center and in the computer lab can access, uh, you know, or look for uh, the cemetery plot or the neighboring plots that so that they can narrow down their find. Um, but Yes, uh, for us, for us, it grew too fast. Uh, and so everything was in files in that M drive, but not organized, not organized by person or by place. And so uh, some difficulty in getting to, and so the librarian doesn't always have the time to sit personally with person by person. And so that's the reason for the easy access, you know, okay. uh, large icons. Mm -hmm. whatever it takes <laughs> again so, so that building organization into it or catching up with your organization is going to help with the access for the community but it is i mean it's it's nice it's nice to hear the community can just walk in and sit down and they have access to the archive that you have which i think is really really kind of nice a lot of times also people want to share what they have too yeah. And so it's nice to uh, scan it in, like I say, and direct it to toward the right area to place it yeah. so that it's easily seen and it stands out. Yeah. And, and Katie, how about yourself, the, this relationship between, you know, your the gathering or the collecting and the archive, you know, uh, what are your thoughts with, you know, what I feel like is your very different kind of working experience at uh, Isabel's, I think. So, so what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the idea of the archive is actually kind of pretty new to us, and that's why we're, we're working with Manitos in order to um, to share ideas and learn from all the work that you're doing, because at this point, you know, we have a huge library of stories, and often um, often our, our platforms are through events and through broadcasts and, and things like that, which is great, but, um, you know, then, then the archive is the idea of where where these stories can live after the event happens um, and the experience. So, yeah, we've been in talks with you all at Manitos, um, talking with the Santa Fe Public Libraries. We kind of prototyped a project last year with the Santa Fe Art Institute um, and UNM, where we were gathering stories around the development of the Midtown campus, and we created a website. And so we were putting the the stories on there as a website and um hoping to develop an actual map and that's still one of our goals is to have a map that lives somewhere on a, on a website um <clears throat> and you know where you can where you can see the stories on the on the map and be able to click on them and and hear them um or listen to them or watch them um and so that's still a goal of ours is to is to develop that um and i you know i think it's when we're talking about accessibility, I also try to think about other forms that an archive can take, you know, so there can be a website that people go to, which is great, and I think that needs to exist and, um, and be available, but are there ways that we can bring the archive into communities themselves or bring them to people because you know, the other way around is people need to seek out that archive and kind of know what they're looking for and know what um, 
be be interested. So I'm interested in the idea of you know having place based stories, and we we prototyped that as well with our Presente project and with um, Dr. Esteban Rael Galvez. We did this photo historias project. So we actually had um, historical photos that took place in a specific location. And then we interviewed people um, uh, who told a story. And then when we put, we blew those photos up into a banner, which we tried to install in the, in the location where that story took place. And then there was a little QR code um, that linked to the, a little audio clip from those interviews. And so, you know, that was one, one thing that was a cool idea. And I'd like to try to expand on that. Um, we'd like to expand on that. So places around town, you know, connected to the map, but actually um, in physical locations where you might be able to just listen to a story or, or something like that. Um, I'm really interested in, in doing in developing. Okay. Uh, that, that sort of does lead into my next question a little bit. So let's, let's go ahead and, and, and stick with you, Katie, on this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what do you see about that relationship between an archive and how you're starting to view entering into the archive and lived experience? Because, you know, I feel like you are engaging with people kind of in a space where you're, you know, as opposed to kind of some abstract past you know, you're engaging with them in their lived experience of, of the world. So, you know, do you want to talk a little bit about that sort of stretchy zone, I guess you could call it, between the archive and a lived experience, which don't seem to normally really interact, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting to think about. And um, again, I think trying to figure out different places where people can access those stories is, is a part of that. Um, and um, Isabel, what you were saying too, you know, if you can have there be, uh, have the gathering and the archive happen at the same place. So if someone is hearing a story, have, have it be also, have there be an opportunity for them to record or share a story in response to that story right then and there, I think is, um, is an interesting aspect. So, you know, whether it's like they listen to a story and then it says, okay, now record your response to it. And that goes into the archive as well or something like that. Um, and then, you know, I think there's always the utilization of events and um, experiences where people can come together and share in those stories. And then, you know, we're, we're always trying to connect our work and people's stories to um, to current issues and and pro and um, policies that are are being debated you know and so trying to connect people's lived experiences um, with the policymakers so creating up creating this two-way avenue where policymakers can can listen and respond to people's stories and hopefully, you know, create policies and make decisions that are rooted in those experiences and those stories that they've heard. Um, and at the same time, you know, trying to give the storytellers and, and um, memory sharers uh, more agency in that experience as well. So feeling like, you know, they can share a story, but then have it actually have some sort of impact, I think is really important. And that's especially important for, for young people too, and youth and, um, and you know, creating those opportunities for, um, for the stories to live on and have more of a direct impact on our everyday lives. Okay, um, cool. Uh, so Isabel, um, yourself, kind of the same question, this relationship between the archive and lived experience. Um, you know, because I do feel, I feel like this is a, a space that you particularly are kind of working on and out. I want to ask you the general question, but then I already kind of, you know, there's something that actually that you do that inspired this. So go ahead and, and answer the question directly. And I'm, then I may ask you to elaborate on this thing. So, yeah. Well, um, lived experience lets you involve target areas or people or age groups and even intergenerational times, right? So each, um, each event can bring about evidence, official documents, artifacts, uh, important things that can be useful to other people in current projects. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, we've done things like smartphone tours where mm -hmm. there's that QR code and uh, the public can just scan that and it opens up a map and you follow along that map 
their story that is heard. And so that's an important factor that the story goes outward from the inside from people hmm. and in. And uh, a lot of, yeah, that's very important to me. <laughs> um, losing the question, lived experience. Yeah, yeah. So, so the thing that I was thinking about that almost kind of inspired the question is, you know, uh, which I thought was, uh, um, and, and you asked for this, so this was like a concept that you came up with, which was really, you know, you were doing um, a training for some of your youth on, on uh, the creation of a ceremonial object, and then you wanted them to actually, you know, document this process. And, and so therefore we kind of did a training during that training that was kind of multi-layered uh, to where there was like, a, you know, and you were with an eye towards this, the documentation can now live in case, you know, the teacher isn't available kind of thing. So to me, this was very much an example of this sort of multi-layered approach you were taking to lived experience and the archive. So you want to talk a little bit about what you were thinking about there and why you were doing this particular kind of configure multi-layered configuration where the documentation and lived recording were kind of together. You're talking about the drum that the uh, yes. aid with uh, Comanche Francisco Gonzalez. Yes. And so, yeah, so he made a drum the traditional way and people able to do that aren't easy to find. <laughs> so he did that um, with youth involvement so that the kids did the scraping, you know, that uh, whatever it took to hide. And so there was a process and it's not likely that that process will be repeated, you know, um, not by the youth that have learned it even, or almost anybody else. And so I found it important to record that so that uh, the youth that were not involved in, in the actual process could maybe you know, see how that drum was made and then um, be, be able to copycat or you know, carry on that tradition by following those steps. So it, it's a visual for later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I get, and I think for me, a lot of it was noticing how much the process of documentation I felt changed a little bit. How much attention they actually were paying to the to the drum make. Like the the youth that were present were like somehow the documentation changed their the intensity of their focus. Like actually focused it a little bit more on what was happening as well. It does because you think you might remember every step it takes, but while you're doing it, you yeah. need to write it down you're still going to skip something. And so having the recording, you know, you can go back to and do it over and over again, share it with other people. Too. Yeah. So it's, it has a big, wide, uh, usable aspect. Okay. Uh, and, and so my last question is almost sort of the same question, but it's like a different facet of this. So I, it's like a different emphasis. And uh, let's go ahead and stick with you, Isabel. And, and so uh, just because um, is, uh, you know, you both work, uh, do work that involves, to my mind, community events. Like these aren't necessarily isolated. And here also, I'm thinking a little bit of definitely some plans that um, I know, Katie, you have in the, in, the, in the future. But, you know, so there's a very much an event uh, uh, and in your case, Isabel, maybe some some ritual uh, things that ha happen in active physical space, I guess you could say, right? So this is about the body, bodies moving in space, uh, especially in relation to community, right? And so um, how, how do you see how you would close the distance between that very sort of physical and, and present in reality, for lack of a better word, uh, thing that happens and the archive, right? So this is again, another stretchy space. Um, and, you know, so Isabel's thinking specifically about, I think a lot of time, you know, we've talked about documenting rituals and what's tricky about that sometimes. So I'll stop editorializing and just sort of ask you, what do you see as this relationship between active physical space and the archive, which is often not an active physical space space? Yeah. So um, again, respect uh, overall, because uh, a lot of times you're not in your space, right? You're, you're in someone else's space when you're, you're implementing a new 
and so respected who you invite um, to bring to your space and what they think of it and how it's used. It sounds hard to control, but it it's all in the language again in, in prior, during, and after um, because there's a lot of freedoms in the times of today. And when you're recording the past, um, you know, somebody could easily get offended. Uh, not just somebody, you could be the whole community, it could be a group. You know, uh, so you have to be familiar and, and, and aware of what you're doing and, and uh, how you go about doing that. And uh, be very careful and respectful. A lot of times that has to do with the language that's used to and, uh, mm -hmm. And um, it, there's a lot of respect uh, because there are a lot of freedoms today. And, and so this um, use of technology in, in phones and recording um, equipment is, you know, widespread. And so there, it's very hard to keep things secret or private or, you know, um, cared for. So. You have to be on the watch for that, and you and you need to be able to address people that are doing the recording that aren't familiar with, with the area, and you, you have to you have to take a step forward to approach them and, and, and give them reason for why it's not proper. And, you know, if, if you're at the forefront, um, you have to put yourself up front, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and you have to be familiar with who you're representing, and. Um, and uh, take care of their comfort level first, in my opinion. Right. So that physical space is really a very charged space, actually. It's very much where the technology can run rampant without, uh, without acknowledging what's actually happening there in, in, in a place, a specific place at a specific time. Yeah, and then, you know, a lot of other things, because you gotta, you gotta also take a look around and, and what's behind uh, the, the uh, the area that you're putting on camera, what's behind there? You know, you don't want to include the neighbors when, when they're not part of the project or you know, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> if, if there are sacred sites, uh, just, you just got to inform yourself all the way around and be as careful as you can. And uh, that's mm. the only way you're going to make everybody happy. Yeah. Well, all right. Thanks. And, and I feel like we are coming. Ooh, you got to uh, teach that too to, to your kids that are doing the recording. Okay, so that kind of situational awareness you feel is a skill that actually can be taught and passed down and like it's like a thing. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to go into those discussions. You've got to explain yeah. why to the kids and, and how they should go about doing things. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. And, and I feel like we're coming full circle, Katie, with you, because I feel like we're arriving back at the idea of trust and and building that trust. So I kind of like the circularity of that, that we're arriving back. But, you know, your own self, because I, I feel like, um, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, and I know that it's going to be even more about, you know, uh, events happening in space and community events that you yourself are doing. So do you want to talk a little bit about again about this question this elastic space between a, a community event and the archive two totally different places like what do you what do you see as happening there yeah yeah well again i think it comes down to um <clears throat> this idea of different points of access right or different different ways of interacting with stories and memories and i think events and and physical spaces are one part of that. So um, so I think it's not having one and not the other, but it's just one part of the, the bigger picture. So the idea of having an event where um, there can be performances and there can be um, screenings of films and there can be audio booths and there can be sharing of food and, and discussions and resources um, you know that's what we're envisioning for our presente project next year um, in 2019 we did presente and it resulted in a multimedia performance at the Lensic, which we also did at, at Capitol High School. And so that was very much a performance and event it was multimedia multi arts. Um, 
but you know, it required people to come to that physical space of a, of a theater in order to experience that. Um, and so, you know, for the next iteration of this project, we want to um, really localize it and have it take the event take place in the neighborhood where the stories have been generated, where the storytellers live, um, that it's their own community celebration of their history and their culture and their house and their their family. Um, so, you know, that's a part of it. And for people to come and share that experience with them and, and celebrate that. Um, so that's that's a big part of it. And then I also see, you know, it always being this kind of cyclical thing, like you have the event and then if you can, you record that event or aspects of the event, then that can be shared in different places and locations. You know, for example, going into schools and, and sharing some of what took place at that event or, um, you know, sharing it out through a newsletter or having it somewhere like that. And then those can be used as prompts for more story gathering and more, um, you know, people to respond to those stories and things like that. So, you know, it just continues sort of in this way. And then those new responses and stories can then lead to another event and so forth, um, things like that. So, yeah, I just think having it all be sort of in this um, like menu of options or ways that people can, can interact and experience the stories um, yeah, that's that's the goal. Great, great. Um, so those are all the, the questions I, I myself particularly had. Before I uh, turn it back over to Bethany to see if she has any questions, do either of you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share or ideas you wanted to get in on this conversation? Yeah. The only thing I'd like to say is that um, um, people like to learn. And they like to share uh, their stories. They like to be heard. Mm -hmm. So having that space ongoing all the time uh, gives them time to prepare and gather. And so um, site, uh, in various sites, but ongoing times. Um, and then having something solid that is that results from that and is long lasting so that it you know, carries on. So, so that tangible thing you were talking about, they need to see a result. It can't just be take away. They need to see it back. Yeah. The result that they can come back to, because a yeah. lot of times they will come back to, you know, that file or whatever it be. And um, after the fact, say, you know, it's whatever they've attended stays in mind for at least the next week or so. And then they decide they have something to add to it. Or, you know, mm -hmm. Oh, cool. beneficial service, I think. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I agree with that, you know, the idea of, um, of the act of sharing your own story and then, you know, also just encouraging people to seek out stories and to, to, um, to learn from them. And like I said in the beginning, to, to be changed by them. Um, or allow yourself to be changed by them. So um, that, you know, we, we're so much now in, in this world of feeling like we're stuck in our, our beliefs and we wanna hold on to what we think is true. So, um, you know, hopefully seeing the archive as a way that can um, just broaden our perspectives and, and bring people together in, in different ways, um, I think is really important. Cool, cool, thank you, thanks. Um, so Bethany, I'm gonna turn it back over to you because in you know if you have any, your questions yourself or anything that you wanted to say. Um, I just wanna, uh, I don't have any further questions, but um, I wanna thank you both, Isabel and Katie. Um, and I think that it's so uh, interesting, something that kept coming up for me in my head was that, you know, people, um, there is so much history already collected, but then it's this, um, and you mentioned this early on, Shane, it's, it's all from the perspective, these collections of history, it's all from the perspective of like someone, an outsider, like coming in and narrating the story. And, um, and I think that to your point, Isabel, people want, people love to learn and want to learn and, but they want to learn that their, their heritage and their stories from 
the perspective of their of their community and their and their family members, the people who preceded them. And so um, I just really respect and commend both of your your guys' work. It just um, it's inspiring, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share um, your insights about it and your experiences. So thanks a lot. Um, Thank you. And we will, in the description of this video, there will be um, some links to helpful materials about all of this information shared. And uh, thank you so much, Shane, for facilitating this conversation. It was excellent. <laughs>